When you read the Old Testament, you'll discover predictions made of the future. You know, the Bible calls them prophecy. And God bets 100% on what he predicts. Now, not everybody does that. In 1876, Western Union sent a memo to its executives that said, telephones, they got inherently no value to us. Today, we got more phones and toilets. In 1962, the Decca Recording Company rejected a band. They said, ah, we don't like their sound. Guitar music's on the way out. That band, the Beatles, sold 177 million albums. In 1984, Rod Thorne, GM of the Chicago Bulls, said, Oh, man, I wish I could draft a seven-foot center, but I picked who I could get. Guy I got, Michael Jordan, he ain't going to turn this franchise around. <laughs> In 1996, many publishers rejected a children's book. They said, yeah, kids aren't interested in wizards anymore. But J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series has sold 500 million copies. You know, some of us, we think we see the future, but we don't. But Isaiah the prophet did. 700 years before Jesus was born, in a thrill of hope to all that heard it, Isaiah predicted Jesus' birth. This is Isaiah 9-6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know, that prophecy, that hope has a name the name of Jesus. And if you need hope this Christmas, there's four thrilling truths in that passage that can change your life. The first of which is right there in, in 9.6. He says, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Do you know every soul needs a wonderful counselor? We got a lot of counselors today, you know, school counselors, marriage counselors, grief counselors, career counselors, a lot of great counselors, but there's only one Wonderful counselor. What makes Jesus wonderful? Well, he's God. There's no problem he can't solve. He knows us. I mean, Jesus, he got into skin, into the human experience, cried our tears, felt our concerns, knew our emotions, even our temptations. Look, Jesus gets you. He understands you, which is exactly what you need in a counselor. You can pour out your heart to him. Through prayer, you can tell Jesus exactly what you feel. Of course, you know, when we go to a counselor, we want not just to vent, we also want some advice, right? We want some counsel. And the best advice comes from Jesus. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 14 says, Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight. I have power. You know, you go to a counselor from an Eastern construct and you'll hear how to work your way up in the life because, you know, Eastern thought is mired in reincarnation. You die, you come back as something else. <laughs> I'm, I'm no fan of that. I mean, who wants to do uh, this pandemic thing again? You come back and do all this COVID stuff. See, if you get counsel from an Eastern mindset, that advice is soaked in Eastern philosophy. And if you get advice from a Western mindset, right? You don't get reincarnation, you get reinvention. Let's reinvent you, you know, get some Botox, some plastic surgery, nip and tuck, suck some gut out, flip it over, dump it in your backside, right? You get a new Instagram account, a gym membership, you'll be brand new. <laughs> Is that true? No, but it's what the West promotes. The East says reincarnate. The West says reinvent. But a wonderful counselor offers not reincarnation, not reinvention, not even rehab, right? But regeneration. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 says, We were dead because of our failures, but he made us alive together with Christ. He makes you brand new, not just a new start. Look, you need more than a new home or a new job or new relationships. You need to be new all the way through. And the only counselor wonderful enough to do that is Jesus. You know, the next thrilling truth that can really change your life this Christmas is, is back there in uh, chapter 9 verse 6. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor Mighty God. Look, every relationship needs a mighty God. See, your soul needs not only a wonderful counselor, but every relationship you have, your marriage, your partner, your family, all those relationships need a mighty God to make that work. Why? Because we all know relationships are not easy. Some kids between ages 6 and 10, they, they were asked about relationships. And Wes, age 10, he was asked, what do people do on a date? And he said, well, on the first date, they tell each other lies. And that usually gets them interested enough to go on a second date. <laughs> I think that kid knows something. Uh, Quincy, age 7, was asked, you know, when is it okay to kiss someone? And she said, well, 
when they're rich. <laughs> Quincy's a little gold digger, isn't she? Uh, Danny, age eight, he disagreed. He said, you know, the rule is if you kiss someone, you got to marry them and have kids. <laughs> you go, Danny. Uh, Jack, age 10, he was asked, how do you decide who to marry? He said, you find someone who likes the same stuff. You know, if you like sports, she should like sports and she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> I don't think Jack's going to be marrying that gold digger Quincy. Right, Riley, age nine, uh, he was asked, hey, how do you make a marriage work? And and Riley said, tell your wife she looks pretty, even if she looks like a truck. Oh, Riley. Two more. Mitchell, age eight, he said, you know, you'd be a good kisser because it might make your wife forget that you never take out the trash. Yeah, even kids know that relationships aren't easy. You know, if you're single, you got to nail down that wonderful counselor. You need that. And if you decide to marry, you start praying for a mighty God because every relationship needs a mighty God. And boy, does he have might. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 26 says, Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Listen, friends, he doesn't miss the stars and he'll never miss you. You and your relationships, they matter to God. I mean, you think about communication issues in a marriage relationship. How many men know your wife has a much better memory of your conversations than you do? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Every time she starts a conversation with you, it should come with a warning, you know, like they do on phone calls, you know, this conversation will be recorded for training and quality purposes, right? <laughs> like if you were to diagram how, how men process life, it kind of looks like the face of a waffle. You know, there, there's a bunch of boxes separated from one another by walls. So the way men process is the first issue goes in the first box. Second issue goes in the second box and so on, right? And men do one box at a time. So when a man's at work, he's in the work box, right? And when he's playing Xbox, he's playing Xbox. And when he's shoveling snow, he's shoveling snow one box at a time. And as a result of a man's singular focus, I mean, we're, we're kind of problem solvers by nature, right? We jump into a box, figure out the problem, assign a solution, move on, right? And if we get into a box and see a problem and we don't know the solution, we still move on. Because why spend time on a problem you don't have the answer to? You know, why talk about it? But while men compartmentalize, women integrate. You know, their process is like a noodle on a plate of spaghetti, someone said. If you trace that noodle, you'll find it touches every other noodle, right? And women are the same way, right? They make emotional connections to all the people and all the stuff that matters to them, which means they're the ultimate multitaskers, right? Ladies, I have seen you, right? You could be FaceTiming your girlfriend and her life's falling apart. At the same time, you're watching a Christmas Hallmark movie and you see some marriage advice from, from one of the characters and you wonder if you should tell your friend about it, but at the same time, you're making a grocery list and, and you're texting your husband to, to pick up the kids from soccer, all while you're pulling a load out of the washer into the dryer, cooking dinner, and you know, you can shut that oven door with the back of your heel, right ladies? <laughs> you're multitasking wonders. And God gave you that gift because the community, the church needs it. But when it comes to talking to a waffle, well, that's frustrating. And you gotta understand ladies, us men, we admire your ability to connect all things. But we get lost a lot. <laughs> like when you come home and you ask us how our truck is running, you know, because you say, I, you know, I thought about your truck today, honey, because I drove by the dealership and I was on my way to buy a new outfit because, you know, we talked about our finances and we have a little bit more money now. And I found this outfit that I knew would look good on me because, you know, I'm a winner and it's my color. And, you know, last year I went to that seminar and what colors look good on you. And that's how I know I'm a winner. And, well, I remember Adele looked good in it. So, you know, back then when she lost all that weight and, you know, sometimes I wonder when celebrities lose all that weight, I wonder if it affects how our girls view their body image. And I'm really concerned about that. And, you know, maybe our girls might just end up with bulimia or anorexia. And maybe, maybe we ought to talk to their school about starting an awareness program to help all of our girls with their body image. And, and you got to understand ladies, that when you do this, us men were frantically jumping boxes, trying to figure out where, where is this conversation going? And, and what we really want to know is what you thought about our truck. <laughs> and here's my point. Relationships, they're not easy, which is why every relationship needs a mighty God. Now, the third thrilling truth that can really change your life this Christmas again is in chapter nine, verse six. He says, for to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. You know, every family needs an everlasting father. 
you know, Christmas time, it's a great time for family. But, you know, some of us, we, we start freaking out at Christmas because, you know, family can stress you out. Like last year with COVID, that was a good time for many of us. But you know, others of us, you know, we thought it was a good time because we didn't have to see family, right? But, but it may be too hard, you know, push that COVID thing another year. So let me just pause here at the point and, you know, let you all know, you don't have to worry about being the ideal family at this church because we realize the ideal family doesn't exist. I mean, I'm not even seeing ideal families in Christmas movies anymore. How many of you guys like Home Alone? Remember that? Uh, it's Lisa and I's favorite Christmas comedy. I, I saw a meme the other day that really sums up what I think about Home Alone. It says, the older I get, the more I wonder what Kevin McAllister's dad did to afford that house and a holiday to Paris for nine people, right? It's a lot of cash at Christmas. But, you know, that's not even the part that puzzles me about that movie. The part that gets me is it's 1990 and they order pizza and it's $122.50 for delivery. I'm thinking $122.50, right? That's like 260 bucks worth of pizza in 2021. That's a lot of money. I think Kevin's dad was like dealing, you know, I do. I like, like his back door saw a lot of traffic, right? I don't know what Mr. McAllister was doing, but that's a lot of moolah. Anyhow, your family, my family, we're all a part of a family. And no matter what your family situation looks like, all families need an everlasting father. Psalm 103, 17 says, the Lord's love for those who respect him is everlasting. His goodness continues to their grandchildren. Look, your family life, it might be rough right now. And we do teach what God says about the ideal family, but we also live in reality because we're all broken. All of us. There are no perfect families. And that goes all the way back, all the way to the originals, to Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, God says to the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you got not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God says, look, I got one rule, right? Don't eat from that tree. Their life is paradise. Like God gave them birthday suits. They get up in perfect weather every day. They don't have to think about what to wear. They got no laundry, no cleaning closets, no picking up socks. They just streak around the Garden of Eden like Disneyland, like the ideal family. But they did the one thing that God said not to do, and they mess it up. So you may be thinking, well, my marriage isn't working out or the previous one didn't work out. But I'm saying to you, yes, that's not God's ideal for you. But God does get the real because the first marriage God ordained well, it was such a mess. He evicted both of them right out of the Garden of Eden, right? They got out of the boot. They had to go to Kohl's and buy clothes. They had to do laundry, fold clothes, right? And then they started to work on God's next command, right? Genesis 128, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. I mean, they had no problem keeping that command. I mean, you might not even believe in God, but you follow that command quite nicely. And so did Adam and Eve. They, they quickly had their first two kids. And then what happens? One kid kills the other. So let me put it to you like this. God understands brokenness in a family, in a marriage, and he doesn't shy away from it. At that first Christmas, he stepped into it. He chose a young virgin and this young girl, this young guy who probably couldn't even get, grow a beard. They, they were clueless, but God himself put a healthy baby into the midst of that mess and said, I want to join. I want to be a part of this, this humanity, this family. And he did it. God entered into the brokenness of our world. And if I could just encourage every mother, every father, every husband, every wife, every blended family, every broken family, no matter what your history has been, make sure the everlasting father is a part of your future. Are are you with me? Right? Make sure the everlasting father is a part of your future. He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to build you up. Now here's the fourth thrilling truth that really can change your life this Christmas. Again, it's here in Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he'll be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. You know, every neighborhood needs a Prince of Peace. This is uh, really two Hebrew words, Prince of Peace. The word there for prince means the one in charge, and that word for peace simply means rest and tranquility. Anybody want a box of that this Christmas? You know, imagine if you opened a box this Christmas and it was full of rest and tranquility. You wouldn't be asking for the receipt on that one, would you, right? You'd keep that gift. You know, 108 years ago in 1914, Europe was hammered by World War I. Germany and the Allies were buried in carnage on the, in the trenches of war. But on Christmas Day, a miraculous moment of peace occurred. Let me show you. Take a look. Jenkins, I'm clean. No.
Ein Blitzer kommt! Ein Blitzer kommt! Kim? Kim! Don't, don't do it! Halt! Er ist nicht bewaffnet! Nein, Otto! My name is Jim. My name is Otto. Pleased to meet you, Otto. Freut mich. Rose, she's called. I'm schön. I'm schön. You know, when I watch that young guy bravely step up out of that dirty, rat-infested trench with his hands in the air as if to say, hey, it's Christmas, <laughs> can we not, like, shoot each other and can we have a bit of peace? That moment in history makes me think of Jesus. He didn't step up out of that dirty trench. No, he stepped down from the crystal pure streets of gold from heaven itself. This is 2 Corinthians 8, 9. You know that Christ was rich, but for you he became poor, so that by his becoming poor, you might become rich. Jesus, he left the riches of heaven. He took on the limitations of flesh, and he came to our rat-infested, beat-up, broken-up world. He became poor so that you and I could have the riches of a relationship with God, the riches of forgiveness, of hope, of a place after we die, of an eternal family, of being one with the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I mean, no wonder we celebrate Christmas. We had a COVID-like virus in our lives called sin with no vaccine, but Jesus came to heal us to forgive our sin. He came so that you could be cured. And when you know you're forgiven, you are a person at peace. When you know you're not, you're anxious. And we live in an anxious world, a world that needs Jesus. You know, see, if you want lobster, you don't go to McDonald's. You go to Red Lobster, right? If you want a chicken sandwich, you don't get a Taco Bell. You go to Chick-fil-A. If you want a caramel macchiato with two extra shots of espresso and oat milk, you don't go to Jamba Juice. You go to Starbucks. And, you know, if you want a bed, bath, and beyond, what do you do? I mean, listen, if you want peace, you don't have to search for it online. You go to the Prince of Peace. If you're full of anxiety, you go to Jesus. Because peace, it's not a place. Peace, it's not even a season. Peace, it's a person. It's Jesus. Look, we're going to pray. And I want to give you the opportunity to receive the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace into your life. And if you'd like to pray that prayer today and become a Christian, if you'd like to know God in the way that we've talked about it, would you pray this prayer with me right now? Would you just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. Jesus, I give you my past, all the sins, all the wrongdoing. I confess that. I admit that I need your forgiveness. And I need to turn away from my patterns of sinfulness. So today, Jesus, I receive the future that you have for me, your peace. Again, with your eyes closed and your head bowed, in just a moment, I, I'm going to ask you, would you just put hashtag Jesus in the feed right now if you prayed that prayer? Look, this is never a, a way to just single you out. It's just a way of saying, hey, I really meant what I prayed. So if you pray that prayer, would you right now put hashtag Jesus in the feed? It's a simple, simple way to let us know about a fundamental, incredible truth that's happened in your life. So hashtag Jesus in the feed right now. Thank you. 
Thank you for doing that. Lord, I want to pray right now for everyone who just put hashtag Jesus in the feed, who made that decision. And Lord, for those that may be even nervous about doing it, but they made the decision anyway, may this, Lord, be the best Christmas, the best life they've ever had. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much, friends, for being with us for this special time in this incredible Christmas season. And I hope that we're a blessing in your home, and I hope that Christmas starts off well for you. Look, we want to see a thrill of hope, even in weary times. Join you and your family this Christmas. Hey, thank you again for watching. We'll see you again next week. Here's Deanna with the details. Hey there. Thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye.